Al Jazeera podcast. My wife came over to me running excitedly, waving her phone in my face to show me the notifications. On November 29th, former U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger died. And this is how journalist Spencer Ackerman got the news. And I thought about the ways in which it was likely his innumerable crimes would be whitewashed in the obituaries that were about to come. Kissinger was the architect of U.S. policy during the Cold War. Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Chile, East Timor, Bangladesh, Argentina, the Kurds, you can really go on. And diplomatic breakthroughs. He's met Chinese leaders Mao Zedong, Xi Jinping, and everyone in between. Kissinger has been a giant of our world order for half a century. He was relied on by some of the most powerful men and women around the globe and reviled by millions of others. So who was Henry Kissinger and what is his legacy? I'm Malika Bilal and this is The Take. The obituaries that have rolled in for Henry Kissinger all highlight his personal story, his decades of public service, and his role as an elder statesman. Spencer's broke the mold, starting with the headline of his Rolling Stone piece. The headline is, Henry Kissinger, war criminal beloved by America's ruling class, finally dies. And that is what I think in a nutshell, that history ought to remember about Henry Kissinger and what, as importantly, it ought to remember about American elite reception to Kissinger. So let's start with his rise to power. Now all of you will want to hear from the new Secretary of State. On September 22nd, 1973, President Richard Nixon announced his new Secretary of State. There is no country in the world where it is conceivable that a man of my origins could be standing here next to the President of the United States. Born Heinz Kissinger in Germany in 1923, he fled the Nazi government as a Jewish refugee. In 1938, he settled in the United States. He joined the army during World War II using his language skills in military intelligence. After the war, Kissinger earned a doctorate in political science at Harvard. The degree proved fruitful. It was the Cold War, and in 1969, Kissinger joined the Nixon White House and began working on the war in Vietnam. And as Spencer says, the price of that war was immense. Kissinger, in order to make sure that he benefited in 1968, in terms of getting a senior political appointment, spied on and ultimately sabotaged talks to end the war in Vietnam, a war that continued with thousands and thousands and thousands of deaths, which led directly to the secret and illegal bombings of Cambodia and Laos, all for power. Cambodia and Laos bordered Vietnam, and Kissinger ended up overseeing a secret campaign to carpet bomb them. During the Vietnam War, American planes dropped around 285 million cluster munitions on Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. A secret U.S. bombing of Cambodia that killed as many as 150,000 civilians that Kissinger authorized during the U.S. war in Vietnam. It's been called a war crime by journalists like Spencer and others. And it's what So Paul Ear remembers most. I mean, you know, they say only the good die young. I, it, it's, it, in this case, <laughs> he obviously lasted 100 years. So Paul is Cambodian-American and fled Cambodia's brutal dictatorship with his family when he was a baby a dictatorship that U.S. Cold War policy enabled, 
known as the Khmer Rouge. I'm a survivor of, of the Khmer Rouge, uh, having escaped uh, in uh, 76, having had the opportunities that I've had to uh, advance my education and career. Today, he's a professor at the Thunderbird School of Management in Arizona, and he's learned a lot about Henry Kissinger's role since. His involvement was far more hands-on than I knew at the time. You know, you think of these policymakers as, yeah, they write memos, but over time, having studied what, you know, how much he actually chose targets, it's clear that it was more than just policy making it's 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 a it's an involvement that's that's unusual in its extent and so paul says he would hate for history to be written in a way where kissinger's legacy in southeast asia is forgotten you know obviously he will be idolized by those who see him as a titan of foreign policy of a genius who brought china to the united states and the united states to china who served as Secretary of State for eight years as National Security Advisor, as, as the, the very man who gave us the, the phrase, there are no permanent friends or enemies, only interests, but who obviously had severe consequences on, on Cambodia, where I was born. Over the years, there were calls from around the world for Kissinger to apologize for the bombing of Cambodia and Laos. He never did. This was him speaking about it decades later. I'm in my 90s, so I, I've heard that uh, I, I think the word war criminal should not be thrown around in the domestic debate. It's a shameful, it's a reflection on the people who use it. He went on to compare the actions he sanctioned to the Obama administration's drone campaign in Pakistan which I think is justified. And therefore, I believe that what was done in Cambodia was justified. And it was a tactic that the U.S. continued to use as the war in Vietnam dragged on. On Christmas Day 1972, the U.S. launched an air war on North Vietnam to convince Hanoi to resume peace talks. The 1973 Paris Peace Accords followed. That marked the beginning of the end of the U.S. war in Vietnam. Kissinger was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, though it was later revealed that he had derailed talks years earlier, says Spencer. You know, shudder to imagine how many people would still have been alive had Kissinger not sabotaged the Paris Peace Accords, which ultimately and extremely cynically, he would win a Nobel Peace Prize for. The wars in Vietnam and Cambodia were all part of the U.S. campaign to stop the spread of communism. But when it came to the Soviet Union and communist China, Kissinger turned to diplomacy. He helped Washington and Moscow negotiate their first arms control treaties. In 1972, in a move that shocked much of the world, the U.S. made its opening to China. President Richard Nixon visited Beijing. Kissinger spoke about that approach years later as well. Our strategy was to position ourselves in such a way that we were closer to Soviet Union and China than they were to each other. So that in every crisis, we had more options than they did. But it wasn't just Asia and the Soviet Union. Kissinger left his mark around the globe, backing military governments to stave off this perceived communist threat in Greece, Argentina, and Chile. There was no policy uh, since to assassinate, to assassinate any foreign official. That was Kissinger not long after the coup in Chile. But secret White House recordings later revealed Kissinger knew the CIA helped General Augusto Pinochet launch the coup. And not only that, the U.S. State Department had tried to warn Pinochet's government against killing his political opponents. Kissinger canceled those warnings. Sometimes statesmen have to choose among evil. For Spencer, 
Chile stands out in memory. It was a place where the Cold War became, perhaps you might say, its truest self. It is difficult to understand the world we live in today without understanding, particularly in a place like Chile, where with uh, Kissinger's crucial support for overthrowing a democratic socialist government in 1973 of Salvador Allende, through the creation that followed of the, the Pinochet dictatorship and its use as a laboratory for neoliberalism, we see in a really important and direct way a template for the neoliberal age enforced by American power that we currently live in. Kissinger left similar marks on regions across the world, from South Asia to the Middle East, where he brokered an end to the 1973 war between Arab countries and Israel. And his power lasted longer than many U.S. presidents. Nixon resigned as a result of the Watergate scandal in 1974. Kissinger stayed as Secretary of State during the administration of President Gerald Ford. After his formal career in the State Department, he moved to a life as an informal advisor around the world. Earlier this year, at the age of 100, he was still crossing continents. It is a great privilege to be able to visit China. Kissinger met with China's defense minister. A man sanctioned by the U.S. who had refused any form of communication with Biden administration officials including his opposite number in the Pentagon. And his influence on the U.S. leaders of the present continues. Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, Anthony Blinken. Henry Kissinger has been a friend of mine. I've liked him, I've respected him, but we've been friends for a long time. Henry's been a uh, very good friend and a very willing counselor. Uh, over the course of my tenure as Secretary of State. He truly is uh, such a remarkably astute and indefatigable presence in the world. Secretary Kissinger really set the standard for everyone who followed in this job. As for the rest of Kissinger's legacy, both Sopal and Spencer say it shouldn't be ridden by the powerful. This exercise isn't just about, you know, pulling out all the weeds and leaving the flowers. It's really about letting the, the flowers and the weeds coexist and being able to say, yes, he did these incredible things, but he also had this other side that shouldn't be forgotten. Kissinger's legacy is the devastation of so much of the world in the name of husbanding, expanding, protecting, and applying American power, and nothing more. His legacy is written in blood, and to be euphemistic or polite about that is to disrespect the dead and to reinforce the dynamics that allowed someone like Henry Kissinger to live with impunity as a free man his entire life. And that's The Take. This episode was produced by Miranda Lynn, Amy Walters, and Nagin Oliayi, with Chloe K. Lee, David Enders, Sonia Bagat, Farinisa Campana, Ashish Malhotra, Khalid Sultan, Zaina Bezer, and me, Malika Bilal. Our sound designer is Alex Roldan. Alexandra Locke is The Take's executive producer. And Ney Alvarez is Al Jazeera's head of audio. We'll be back.